I'm very excited today. Um, I, I, I have to start to say that as director and CEO of the Sacramento Zoo, Jason Jacobs has a very busy job right now and for the next few years. I think you all know that the Sacramento Zoo leadership has been seeking to replace the 14-acre zoo at Land Park with a new zoo for some time, and they think they can do it in Elk Grove. Uh, that will create a zoo that will be at least four times larger than the one we now have in Land Park. The Land Park Zoo does not meet current standards for providing appropriate habitat for its animals and, and to provide services for visitors in large part because it's too small and it's landlocked. The zoo needs lots of approvals uh, in order to uh, begin operation. Uh, the next one we think is going to come pretty soon in early May from the city of Elk Grove. They also need approval from Sacramento County, various other local agencies, and the state and federal governments. But I know that Mr. Jacob, Jacobs is quite optimistic about getting those approvals. He started his career at Zoo Miami and on the operating uh, team of Des Disney's uh, Animal Kingdom in Florida. Uh, before taking over the Sacramento Zoo, he was director at the Reed Park Zoo in Tucson. Mr. Jacobs is a graduate of Florida International University. Again, I'm very excited to, to hear this talk. Mr. Jenkins, this microphone. There should be a microphone right there. All right. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Usually I have no problem filling a room like this just with my voice, but they told me that if I don't speak on the microphone, then the folks watching on Zoom can't hear. So, uh, Thank you so much. And you all can call me Jason. I'm not Mr. Jacobs. That's my dad. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here. I have driven by this campus so many times. I moved here in December of 2017 from Arizona, and it's really a lovely campus. I mean, it, it's really beautiful. So it was it's great just to get here and park and walk around. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit about my background. And uh, then we're going to talk about the Sacramento Zoo. So these are the logos of the six places I have worked in my life. And I've only worked in zoos my entire life. I started when I was a teenager at Zoo Miami. I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. I'm the most pale man you'll ever meet from Miami. Uh, when I was in college, I did an internship on the opening crew of Disney's Animal Kingdom which was really the last major zoological park to open in the United States. Uh, major meaning over a million visitors a year, and Disney's Animal Kingdom does well over a million visitors a year. They they probably do 11 to 12 million visitors a year. So life comes full circle, but more on that later. Uh, after graduating from Florida International University, I went to the Potawatomi Zoo in South Bend, Indiana, where I was the curator and later deputy director. It was a nice AZA accredited zoo, and we did a lot of great things to bring up its uh, its position within the community. Potawatomi Zoo, uh, if I said the university that is only a mile and a half away from it, you would all know that. It's the University of Notre Dame. So that was... Uh, it was interesting living there for a few years, and I had never seen snow when I moved to Indiana, ever. And I moved there in January, and I didn't know that when your locks freeze up, don't throw hot water on it. because it just. So I could not, after about four years, I was offered an administrative position at the Los Angeles Zoo, where uh, I oversaw a huge revenue goal every year of 20 to 25 million. This was back in 2005. I mean, when 20 to 25 million bought you something back then, you know, now it's, uh, but our board chair at the LA zoo was, uh, Betty White, who was a dear friend of mine. And I miss her tremendously. I got to ghost, uh, write her book on zoos and animals, and it meant the world to me. And, uh, I tell people, the world loves her, but I'm one of the few she loved. And this cheek has been kissed many times in her lifetime. So uh, I miss her a lot. And uh, I left the Los Angeles Zoo to become a zoo director at the zoo in Tucson, Arizona, uh, where I was fortunate enough to oversee the birth of the first elephant ever in the state of California. I'm sorry, in the state of Arizona. And I was there for four and a half years, and the big thing was the elephant, but also passing a dedicated sales tax just for that zoo. The sales tax passed and generated $130 million for the zoo. 
I don't know how much really. I know it's over 130 million because two days after it passed, I gave my notice to go to the Sacramento Zoo because at the time I had family living in the area in Walnut Creek. My sister and brother-in-law and my nephews, they're all back in Florida now, but I didn't come here with the intention of moving a zoo. But uh, we'll talk more about moving a zoo in a minute. So that's that's my career in a nutshell. I've only worked in zoos and it's what I love. I have been to over 250 zoos around the world. Chances are, if you ask me about a zoo, I can tell you about it. I tell you its highlights, what it's known for, what animals, what its staff specializes in. It's my life. I love it. I go to visit zoos and I go see animals in the wild and tacky tourist attractions I also like. Anyway, so a little bit of highlights from my career, just, you know, there's my master's degree from Disney University, master's degree, you know, that you get when you uh, attend Disney's internship program. Jack Hanna on the right, one of my mentors being on his show, really great guy who unfortunately right now has Alzheimer's. So we, we say a lot of prayers for him. Uh, and the baby elephant to Tucson and my friend Betty White. And then in the right hand corner is is my good friend Mo and Mo is an Okapi. Okapis are the coolest animals you've never heard of. They are the closest living relative to the giraffe. And not only do we care for Okapi at the Sacramento Zoo, but we manage the U.S. population of Okapis. Every 80, there's 87 Okapis in the United States. They're all pedigreed. And we know who is who, who should breed with whom. And our animal care manager decides that. And I sit uh, as the vice president of the Okapi Conservation Project, which is located in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's all about people empowerment. You take care of the people, they'll take care of the animals. So I love what I do. Now, many of you have probably grew up going to zoos. How many show of hands grew up going to a zoo? And the zoos from when you were a kid are probably a lot different than what they are now. They've really evolved where zoos used to be um, menageries with cages and rocky grottos. And now they've evolved into immersive habitats for animals where we try to replicate the animals' habitats as much as possible, focused on wellness-centered design. And um, it's not just what you see on the outside, but also what you see backstage, the evolution of animal care, where you might used to see lions in cages. Now we can train animals like big cats and great apes to take injections. Our cheetahs at the Sacramento Zoo, uh, we can grab their tails through the mesh. They're trained that we can hold it and draw blood from them. We can give them injections. That's a lot less stressful for an animal than having to put it in a squeeze cage or anesthetizing it to give it a routine checkup or something, right? So, you know, when you see huge areas behind the scenes, like uh, that area at another zoo, there's a lot that goes into the off habitat areas of zoos that the public never sees. Uh, so much work that the animal care staff do with the training and uh, positive reinforcements, which is basically, you know, if you have a favorite food, I can get you to do almost anything for that favorite food. So that's what, you know, positive reinforcement is all about. But there's just so much that goes on behind the scenes of the modern zoo. And, and really, the modern zoos are all about experiences and education, right? It's getting people close to animals, getting people interacting with them safely where there's no degree of, uh, you know, transmission of disease, but because when you see something, you care about it. And something that Jack Hanna told me, he always told me this, to teach the mind, you have to touch the heart. And zoos do that better than any other group out there. A lot of people, you'd be surprised at the startling statistic. Zoos, accredited zoos in the United States have a higher combined attendance than the annual attendance of NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and NHL hockey. We see over 200 million people a year. Thank you. Who is Was that Judy clapping or no? Okay. So zoos have an incredible opportunity to teach, and the world is going to need good zoos more than ever for a couple reasons. Number one, one of the things we do is we take care of animals in the wild. Just like I mentioned, I sit on the board of that Okapi Conservation Project located in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The DRC is not a safe area of Africa to travel to. There is no ecotourism industry. I don't go there. My job is to make sure they get the resources they need so that the people there, the local conservation heroes, can save those animals. 
other African countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, South Africa, they have well-developed ecotourism programs. When people go on safari, those safari dollars go to help save animals. But we as a zoo generate hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that go to save animals in the wild. For instance, in Tanzania, we employ a full-time population biologist for a giraffe. Giraffe are undergoing a silent extinction. There's less giraffe now in Africa than there are elephants. There's only about 130,000 left. It's a very small number. But the other important conservation factor of zoos, we've talked about kids and kids of all ages, right? Impacting them is building capacity through our zoological parks to manage rare and endangered species. The best example is that parrot up in the corner. That's a thick-billed parrot. Thick-billed parrots are the only species of parrot that are native to the United States. They're found in the Sky Islands of Arizona and the Sky Islands of Northern Mexico. Sky Islands are an incredible micro ecosystem that features alpine habitat in the middle of deserts at the top of these mountains. They're a very specialized parrot. There's maybe 2,000 of them left in the world. If I was a zoo director that just cared about the bottom line, I would take our thick bill parrot aviary and just put lovebirds in there or cockatiels or budgies. You know, to most visitors, a parrot's a parrot. But the Sacramento Zoo has hatched more thick bill parrots than any other institution in the world. We once again manage that population globally, and we care for more of these thick bill parrots than any other species, than any other zoo in the world. And every parrot that we hatch is a precious individual, and we go through painstaking efforts to rear those chicks. Incredible. I mean, it's you should see what our staff does with them. But the other examples on this you know, pan golden frogs, golden lion tamarins, roughed lemurs, all those would be extinct in the wild if it were not for zoos. Tigers, which everybody in this room knows, everyone knows what a tiger is. A lot of people don't realize that there's less than 3,000 tigers left in all of Asia. The only country that tigers will thrive in 25 to 30 years from now is India. They'll be wiped out everywhere else. You know why they'll thrive in India? Because there's a dedicated ecotourism program for people to go see them in the wild. And that money when people spend goes to help them. You can't see an Amir tiger. The Amir tigers are the ones that live in Russia and North Korea. Uh, the Malayan tigers, which live in Thailand and the Malaysian Peninsula, impossible to see. India has a lot of grassy woodland, monsoon grasslands, as they're called. You could see the tigers there. It goes back to the thing you touch, you know, touch the heart to teach the mind, as I said. So. Zoos are very important. The world is going to need good zoos more than ever to build capacity and manage rare and endangered species. So many of you who went to the Sacramento Zoo, who have, how many of you have, all, have been to the zoo? Most of you, all right. The zoo opened in 1927. It's located on 14 and a half acres. And its last major public investment, meaning when the local government spend money on uh, upgrading the zoo, does anyone want to guess when that was? No, it's a little more recent than that. 1961. And if you see those polar bear grottos, those were built in 1961. And the walls to those grottos still stand. One of them's empty. I've combined one of those grottos into two to house our lions to give them more space. Uh, we have capybara in one and snow leopard in the other. But we are dealing with a crumbling age infrastructure because zoos are much different now than they were in 1961. And certainly then in 1927. Oops going backwards. So the challenges with our zoo is we have a limited footprint of 14 and a half acres in a growing metro population of 2.5 million people and growing. When you look at similar size metro populations and their zoos, cities like Cincinnati, Kansas City, San Antonio, their zoos all see over half a million visitors a year. We see, I'm sorry, they all see over a million visitors a year. We see a half million because we don't have parking. We have lost our animals, a lot of them. I, I give this example that if you ever go to Disneyland, you know, I'm sure many of you have been to Disneyland living in California. What if Disneyland all of a sudden next week got rid of the castle, got rid of Pirates of the Caribbean, got rid of Space Mountain? You'd have some upset people. Every day I have kids asking me, where's the hippos? Where are the tigers? Where are the chimpanzees? The truth is they're gone because we don't have the facilities to take care of them, and they're not coming back unless we do something drastic. Drastic and wonderful at the same time, which is the new zoo. So we have a lot of challenges with our current site, but we need to fulfill our mission, and that's engaging as many people as we can and taking care of animals. 
these are the type of facilities I was faced with when I arrived in early 27, I'm sorry, in early 2018. They had animals living in them. We tore them all down or they're empty now. And the animals have been moved to better zoos or better habitats within the zoo. So how we got on this path to Elk Grove was shortly after I arrived, Mayor Steinberg, mayor of Sacramento, obviously, asked us to look at the Sleep Train Arena because at that time, the Kings had moved to the Golden One Center downtown and Sleep Train, they didn't know what they were going to do with. So we, I said, how much time do you, can I have to figure out if this will work for the zoo? They said, could you do it in three months? And I said, we'll do it in three months. So I brought in folks who helped design Disney's Animal Kingdom and a lot of other uh, zoo professionals. And we figured out if Sleep Train would work for a zoo, zoo within three months. And we did. It would work. And what happened was, you know, there was just, we kept getting, look at this space. Look at this space. Look at Bing Maloney Golf Course. Look at North Natomas Regional Park. Look at Cal Expo. And we would look at these areas and then we would have these areas taken away from us. Um, and finally, in a moment of incredible courage, because the zoo is owned by the city of Sacramento, but it is operated by the Zoological Society, a private nonprofit, and we have operated it without a significant subsidy for over 25 years. The board of the Zoological Society gave me permission to go seek another municipal partner. It's the same equivalent if you watch sports as the, the Raiders leaving Oakland to go to Las Vegas, right? So very quietly, I contacted the city of Elk Grove and we, they were looking for a major, major project that could change the face of their city. And I was looking for a home for animals. And we signed an exclusive negotiating agreement in September of 2021. And since that time, we have moved the project all the way through to design documents. It's been approved by the planning commission. It's gone through EIR. And the final process for this will be on May 8th. If any of you play video games, it's called the final boss. May 8th is when mayor and council will decide whether they want to approve the project with the attached budget, and then we will get shovels in the ground and we're going to start building. So the new zoo is located about 20 minutes from the current site, proposed location. It's right off 99. Not only is it off Highway 99, but Canama Road will be the site of a very large connector road that will run from 50, 99, all the way to I-5. It's about three quarters of a mile east of the New Sky River Casino. It's an incredible location to attract people traveling both to Southern California and folks traveling up to Northern California, a mile off the interstate with planned 10 acres of parking and a 65-acre zoo. We modeled it off the Houston Zoo, which is a 55-acre zoo that sees two and a half million guests a year. So it is our vision for a wild tomorrow, creating a world of discovery, community, and conservation. And what you see are renderings of what you'll look at, what it'll look like when you walk into the new zoo. The new zoo, we want to put the wildlife first. These are some of our core values. I don't need to read them all. You can read them. But uh, it's going to be a very different zoo than what we have in Land Park, especially when you see some of the habitats that we're planning for these animals. This is a significant graphic down here in the uh, this corner. This little gray blob is the current zoo. This would be the new zoo. It's it's a it's a pretty big uh, change, and that doesn't even that orange blob doesn't even include the parking. Parking's on the outside. We are designing it. We know we can reach a million people or more a year, so uh, we are going to design the zoo that this community reserves. And I say the greater Sacramento community, the current zoo sees visitors all the way from Redding, Reno, Tahoe, Vacaville, Fairfield, Stockton, Modesto, all over. They come to our zoo. They come because it's the only zoo really in the region with exotic animals, right? And if you drive to San Francisco, you got to go over those bridges, which is, you know, takes a little while. So we are going to redefine what the zoo is and create a transformational project for this region. Yep. Good thing I'm not a pilot, right? Because, yeah. Okay. This is what the approach to the new zoo will look like. 
We're going to have sculptures of okapi and giraffe out front, two of our uh, signature conservation projects. This is a layout of the new zoo. So these big white areas uh, right here, this will be phase two of Africa. This will be Australasia. Phase two of Africa will include uh, overnight lodging overlooking an African savanna featuring hippos, rhinos, zebras, and other animals. There'll also be African apes and hyenas and African painted dogs and a lot of microfauna also. Australasia will take you along the Wallace line, which divides flora and fauna of Asia and Australia. So in Australia, you might see little blue penguins, quokka, which are the most adorable marsupial there are, wallabies, uh, black cockatoos, kookaburras, and then you'll move through like Indonesia where you'll see Komodo dragons, and eventually you'll see tigers and orangutans. So that's Australasia. In the front will be California, where we'll focus on some of the macro fauna of California, like a grizzly bear rehab center and rescue center for grizzly bears to bring grizzly bears back, our state animal. Um, elk, because we're in Elk Grove, uh, river otter and beaver, but we're going to have a lot of the microfauna from things like banana slugs to the different rattlesnakes to the king snakes to an aquarium that showcases the fish that live here in the Delta, things that people have never seen before because who goes snorkeling in the Delta? You know, I mean, you don't, you don't want to drink a mouthful of that water, right? So there'll be a California classroom. We'll showcase our conservation projects for Western pond turtle. And we'll also have a rescue and rehabilitation center for animals in need that won't see visitors, animals like, for instance, when we have these wildfires and we need to uh, take care of bears or bobcats or whatnot. But all of that can't be done unless we get phase one done first. So here you got the parking to orientate yourself. North is going that way towards that exit door. West is this way. This site here, this main exhibit, which you're going to see is over three and a half acres for our giraffes. Our giraffes right now live in an area which is smaller square foot wise than a CVS pharmacy or a Walgreens. Okay. We will be one of the leading zoos to care for Maasai giraffes, which is the species that we will be working with. This is a behind the scenes care quarter. We have huge habitats for lion, cheetah, Meerkat, rhinoceros, our thick bill parrots will be over here in the children's section. So we can talk about conservation. There'll be an ADA accessible playground for kids. Our carousel will move. We'll have some other habitats. We have our veterinary center, our animal diet center, um, aviaries for our flamingos, our okapi habitat. And there's a lot of other things in this whole project in the first phase, which we'll go into. So uh, really some dynamic habitats, but we have to get this done. The city of Elk Grove in, is investing over $150 million of the, in this project. We have to raise $50 million, and we're, we are well on our way. We'll announce to the community on May 6th, May 6th or May 8th, how much we have raised for a project that has not even been officially approved yet. And I think it'll shock anyone in this room. There are people who have given well over a million dollars to this project because they believe in what they do. It helps animals. It helps people. But the people most excited about it are the people that come up to my waist because they're the ones that are going to inherit this community tomorrow, more so the earth. We need good zoos. We're going to have a restaurant up front that's designed like an African lodge where you can go to dinner any night of the week. And if it's nice out, like a nice like, night like tonight, you'll be able to dine and see giraffes right outside. You can have a drink. You can host one of your events there because we're going to have an event center that can accommodate 350 people, let alone the people in this room. We could do that for sure because people want an experience. You might sit out on the deck and see the uh, giraffes and you'll see the lions. The lions will be in the highest part of the zoo. If you've ever seen the Lion King, we're going to build something that looks like Pride Rock, uh, which is, it's called a copy Copies are volcanic outcropping that you find in East Africa. And the lions like to sit up there and survey their habitats. This is the 3D model of half of the giraffe habitat. And you can see the size of the giraffes compared to this habitat. Now, this water, it's a little, it's not as realistic because there's areas in here that are going to be planted. They're slightly, if you can see like from here to here, the shade of blue changes because these are very sh shallow planted marshes. We're going to look at getting perhaps African antelope that live in marsh. There's a uh, uh, antelope called the Sitatunga 
that swims. It has actually webbing between its hooves. We don't know yet. We're going to figure out what animals go in there with the giraffes, but this is just half of it. The giraffes will cross over this area eventually over the visitors into another veld, and the total space of just the animal habitat is three and a half acres. This is that restaurant I told you about, and this is the events venue. And if everything goes well, this preview center could potentially open in 2027 with the rest of the zoo opening about 18 months later. Every major habitat we will have will have a conservation story connected to it that wildlife biologists that studies giraffe populations is employed by Wild Nature Institute, one of our major conservation partners. How we finance that partnership is through something that's very fun and enriching for our guests. We let guests feed the giraffes. They pay $5 to feed the giraffe with the proceeds going to help save giraffes in the wild. That's with a half a million visitors. Can you imagine what we can do when we have a million visitors feeding the giraffes and having that experience? And so we want to surround you with giraffes. We also are going to have a lion habitat that you'll go up into the copy and see them. Now, there's glass between the people and the, the lions, but the program we support with lions is located in Botswana because, you know, there is no wild left. When people think of the wild, lions, for the most part, live in areas that are managed, like national parks and reserves. But when they leave those parks and the farmers that live next to them and they start killing the farmers' cattle or goats or whatnot, that's when those challenges happen. And we can't go in. It would It would not be right. For Jason Jacobs to go in and say, hey, don't kill those lions. That's not what you should be doing, right? We're not one to talk. The grizzly bear is on our state flag. There hasn't been a grizzly bear in California in the wild in over 100 years now. So we work with those farmers. We radio collar the lions. When the lion comes near the farm, sensor goes off. The farmers can go out, shoot a gun up in the air, or release their dogs to scare the lions away. That's all it takes. You don't have to kill or poison the lion. So that's another example of a conservation program we'll highlight at the new zoo. We support cheetah conservation. Cheetahs are an incredible animal. They can run from zero to 60 really quick. But once they've done that, a couple hundred yards, they can't run like that for a couple days. They are built for speed. They are not built for power. Uh, Full-grown cheetah might weigh 90 pounds. Our cheetah boys are about 99 pounds. They're a little overweight, uh, but they're really well-trained. We have two incredible cheetahs that we could draw blood from them. They purr, they're really cute. I, I'm being very anthropomorphic, right? But uh, I see them outside my office. My office looks into the cheetah habitat. So it's a great view. I've got the best view of anyone in the region, but we're gonna have, uh, those trucks don't have real engines. What we're looking at putting those, there's the tiered viewing like you would see on a safari truck where you might have a drink and the cheetahs will race past you during public demonstrations. The Okapi Conservation Project, I'm going to show you images of an okapi, but like I said, they're the coolest animal you've never seen. They're the uh, closest living rails for the giraffe, and we would build an African forest that you would enter with monkeys, like colobus monkeys and tropical birds, and you would share space with the okapi. You won't be able to touch them, but you'll be able to get very close to them, and they're an animal that's just beautiful. I can tell you they look like microfiber, and they feel like microfiber. They are incredibly soft. Their skin is oily because they live in the rainforest, and that oil helps as a slicker of sorts uh, so that it doesn't penetrate their skin. It just kind of, the water just rolls right off their body. But they are incredibly beautiful and gentle animals, and we are so fortunate to have them. The only zoos on the West Coast to care for Okapi are San Diego and Los Angeles. So the new zoo is current cattle pasture. There is not a tree on the site. And so we knew, you know, when you have a zoo, you got to have monkeys. People love monkeys. Maybe we all see a little bit of ourselves in monkeys. I know, and I don't mean that as an insult. I certainly see a lot of what I do in monkeys. You know, if you want to learn about politics, watch the monkeys. They seriously, but where do monkeys like to live? Say it trees, right? You don't have any trees. So what we're looking at doing is bringing in the only ground dwelling monkey that doesn't sleep in trees but sleeps on the side of cliffs. And these are gelata monkeys. And you can see some of the features we're looking at our carousel and our tree house, but gelata monkeys are grass dwelling monkeys that are facing a lot of challenges in the wild. They are only found in the highlands of Ethiopia. 
Ethiopia has the second fastest growing population within Africa, like within the continent, and they are competing with cattle for grazing ground. The monkeys will lose. So we are working with the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums to import a troop of 20 of these monkeys from the European zoos. The only zoos that have these in the United States are the San Diego Zoo has a few males and the Bronx Zoo has a breeding troop. So we would have a breeding troop thereby eventually increasing the number of these monkeys cared for in the United States as an insurance population. But gelata monkeys were at one time considered to be baboons. If you've ever grew up going to a zoo and you saw baboons, a lot of people look at their butts and say, look at that huge butt, right? It swells up and all that. Have any of you ever seen that with primates? It's called ischial callosity. I look at them, I take pictures of them and I'm not a pervert. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I like animals, right? Not, not in that way. I mean, you know, people, that's, that's the joke. They always say, are you going to breed these animals? I'm like, no, not me. That's illegal. You know, they can, anyway. So, oh, I'm getting a lot of bad jokes. So these are not baboons, although they superficially resemble baboons. They do not have sexual swellings on their butt because they are sitting on their butts all day plucking grass out. And if you ever want to see what a gelata monkey is like, sit you know, with your bottom plucking grass for five minutes and you'll see how tired your fingers get. Their fingers are specially adapted for, towards that. So because their rumps are covered up, their swellings are on their chest. And you can see right here, these swollen nodules, that's a female that's in season, that one isn't. This is what the males look like. The males are about twice the size of the females and they have very impressive canine teeth the largest canine teeth in proportion to their body size of almost any mammal and you can see when they use it they can roll their lips up they have the most vocal repertoire of any primate except humans they're incredible monkeys and so we look forward to bringing a troop of these in for the new zoo pretty impressive they scream like banshees too. It's incredible the sounds they make. But these are those are actually some of the ones we're getting that are in this photo. They're looking forward to coming to California. They're in Germany right now. So uh, a lot of uh, you might be a lot of you might be surprised to learn that zoo veterinary medicine was pioneered at the Sacramento Zoo in conjunction with UC Davis in the late 1950s, early 1960s by Dr. Murray Fowler who founded the zoo vet program at UC Davis. To this day, UC Davis veterinarians take care of all of our animals. We have two full-time vets at the zoo that are UC Davis employees. We have a full-time resident and every vet student does a two week rotation at the zoo. We have trained more zoo vets than any other institution in the world. These vets learn how to take care of animals and in some cases apply those skills to animals in the wild. So it's a great program. We're gonna be able to expand that program uh, with the new zoo You'll be able to watch the animals having surgery in a much more expanded way than you can now. And uh, a lot more research and potential work with that program. And we will have a walkthrough aviary for the flamingos where we'll be able to combine the flamingos with other tropical birds. So oftentimes people ask me, because that's what the first phase is going to be, how you can help. Number one, you can join the Sacramento Zoological Society. You can write a letter or email to the Elk Grove City Council. The final vote is on May 8th. So you can attend the May 8th council meeting. You can make a gift to the zoo. Let me tell you, uh, I don't mean to be like the Home Shopping Network or PBS, but I can provide the most incredible day ever to people who love animals if they're people that help us with our capital campaign. We have a rhinoceros that loves to be scratched. We have oh, copies that like to be scratched. You want to be a king or queen with your grandkids? You let me know. You can host an awareness party for the zoo, for the new zoo. I'm happy to send myself or one of my staff members to someone's backyard. I, I don't refuse food. I'm, I'm happy, you know, and we'll talk about it. And you can shoot me an email, jjacobs at saxzoo.org. Um, and I'll probably say thank you and forward it to one of, our staff who will help you out. But really, we can't get this done without everybody. And this isn't supposed to be a hard sell, but I can tell you, this is the largest cultural project in this region for a long, long time. This will redefine and transform the zoo 
but it makes the entire region stronger. People will come here to see the zoo, to go to a, an NBA game to see the Kings. For three years, at least, they'll be able to see the A's along with the River Cats. They can go to the Crocker Museum. They can go do all sorts of things, but it all creates a stronger package for the region. So that's my little dog and pony show, or I should say giraffe and okapi show. And I'm happy to answer any questions. The The other thing is I've got uh, brochures about here about how you can get involved. And one of our docents, Judy, who's here, uh, they're going to have an art show on Saturday, May 4th at the Old Sugar Mill. So you can look at art, maybe purchase some art and have some wine at the same time. It's from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Judy's one of our very loyal docents. Anything you want to add, Judy? Yeah, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have. It can be about the new zoo. If you have, you know, I, I get questions. Well, if you put a lion and a tiger in a pit, who'd win that type of, I'm, I'm happy to answer any of that. What have you been, been bit by? What have, what's pooped on you? Whatever, I'm happy. So, all right, we got one. Yes. Uh, could you speak a little bit about how you have considered climate change in your planning for the next 20 or 30 years and also energy conservation? So the new zoo is being built as the greenest zoo in the United States. Uh, we are reclaiming water. We are going to be, the goal is to be an all electric zoo. Uh, and you know, we are great agents to talk about climate change. We talk about climate change and how it affects animals all the time. There's an inherent value of having a zoo to speak about issues like that for amphibian conservation, for instance. So those are lesson plans, which we talk about. The docents talk about that, I know. Um, but yeah, we're building it with a lot of environmental efficiencies in mind, using solar power, um, rainwater runoff, collecting all that type of stuff. I could give a whole hour report showing you all those environmental efficiencies so and really climate wise what's most important is that we focus on animals that do well in this climate you saw those images of polar bears we're not bringing polar bears back that's not the right animal for this climate the current zoo has snow leopards well we have one snow leopard that snow leopard's going to leave probably within the next year to go to another zoo we won't be bringing snow leopards back we are concentrating on animals that do well in this climate if they are uh, a small animal like banana slugs, they might be indoors, right, in a terrarium, but we're not going to be looking at polar bears or p penguins from the Antarctic. The penguins we would look at would be the little blue penguins of Australia that live in warm climates. So, and, and it's, that's part of the, it's a long, long answer. I'm sorry, but the. I was concerned about change over the next few years. As all of us are. <laughs> So will there be any uh, push on your part to maintain, to uh, keep the current zoo location and make it either an annex or a specialized part of the zoo or a clinic or something so that we don't lose the current uh, well, location? Well, I would say in an odd way, you've lost the current location already because it has not been invested in, right? It's it's wonderful for what it is, but when you strip away the essence of a zoo that we've sent the hippos away, the tigers, the chimpanzees, the grizzly bears, we're left with a zoo that's in a very expensive city to operate. So unless someone was willing to 100% subsidize the current zoo, that is not part of our, and I don't think anyone's going to do that. We are looking at the new zoo because it, when you open a brand new zoo, no one's going to go to that old zoo. And the new, the old site is owned by the city. They will turn it into some type of park amenity, but it will not be a zoo. Um, and really, it doesn't do our, it doesn't do the zoo's mission justice by having to, by having this little zoo that's clinging on to life when you have a brand new zoo open in the facility in the region, you know, and, and this is not a first, there have been other zoos that have been moved in the United States, Miami moved, Indianapolis, Salt Lake City, uh, Los Angeles did. So the city is looking at sometime it can't, the current site cannot be sold for condos. It cannot be made into a shelter. It has to be a park amenity and they will release, they will seek input from plants. If you have ideas on what you think the, the current zoo should become when we leave, let the city know.
Do you anticipate having light rail or public transportation yes. from the Sacramento? And and I have a two part question then. So when do you? How is that going to happen? It takes years. Yes, years. The city. That's a question for the city of Elk Grove. But the plan is, and I could show you uh, in the parking lot where there's designated space to build a light rail station. The plan is to bring light rail directly to the new zoo at the front entrance. And the second part of the question is. What? How do you anticipate building diversity of families and attendees in Elk Grove? Well, Elk Grove is, I think, the first or second most diverse uh, city within the state of California. It's incredible. We already have an incredibly diverse audience, and uh, we welcome everyone to the zoo. Um, when I walk around the zoo, I'm, I'm there every day, right? I see the faces of everyone. Every every person in this community, every uh, every group you could think of, and it's wonderful. You see children from all over. On top of that, we provide uh, we have a great program called Zoo for All, which we provide tickets for uh, underserved children and their families to come to the zoo. So we'll continue doing that. But Elk Grove is a very diverse community, and really, it's more than just Elk Grove. It is the entire region that goes to the zoo. But you have to get there. You have to get there. Well, that's the long-term plan is to build to build light rail, right? You mentioned a special relationship you have with UC Davis uh, and their veterinary staff. Um, as we've learned, uh, there's an extreme veterinary shortage in mm -hmm. the United States, both for large animals and for pets and and for animals for food. And I'm wondering how that affects, A, the new Elk Grove Zoo, assuming that it passes on May 8th, and uh, B, how it affects zoos all over the country. It depends which zoo you're at. We don't have any issues attracting veterinarians due to our relationship with UC Davis, the number one rated veterinary school in the United States. We hired a veterinarian in the last two years. We had tons of applicants. I can tell you, I get calls from other zoos looking for vets all the time. Um, and I say, well, you know, you should hire a UC Davis graduate. They they graduate with that program from our residency program with enough skills to to do a lot at a zoo. So we're, we're very fortunate to have that UC Davis relationship. But yes, you're right. There is a shortage. Um, and this will help attract hopefully more people to want to become vets. Hi, uh, very exciting news. So uh, I you. think we're all can agree with that. And I have kind of a two part question as well. One, uh, beyond the, the docent and the docent training, would there be other opportunities for volunteers and how would they, what would they be? You know, the docent and the docent training are the, the main ones. There are animal care volunteers. Those are very competitive uh, positions usually reserved for people who are looking to make a career working with animals. But the docent program is a really great program. I mean, it's you get the training and it really helps you uh, just talk about the animals. That's the most important thing is to be a teacher, to talk to and get people interested. And they volunteer for other events and, and other things too. So those are some of the, the great ways you could get involved. Okay, cool. And then there's... Oh, our teen volunteer program. Yeah, we have teens too. Mm. that help out in the summertime and for special projects. And, and there's, there's opportunities for like service organizations. Um, every year, the California highway patrol graduates um, or the CHP. Yeah. They're uh, cadets do a service day at the zoo and they come in, they do a lot. I mean, it's incredible. So if you have a group that wants to volunteer, we'll put you to work. Cool. And then the second question is uh, around Komodo dragons. Really? That's they're that's, vicious. <laughs> that's a long ways off. Komodo dragons, but there's many zoos that care for them in the United States. In California, you can see them at the zoo in Fresno. I think San Francisco still has one, uh, San Diego and Los Angeles. So there's there's enough of them. They're actually quite easy to train. Um, you'd be surprised. And uh, some zoos, people go in with them. I wouldn't, but, uh, you know. Phase one is... Oh, he, his question was, how many acres is phase one? Phase one is a 28-acre zoo with 10 acres of parking. 
to 38 acres of development. It doubles the zoo upon opening day. I was lucky enough to grow up with the San Diego Zoo as my backyard yeah, from that's... four years old to 17 when it was free to everybody up to yeah. 16. Now I'm lucky if I get to go a couple of times a year that it's 50 something for entrance, but it's still grand. I was I was there on Sunday. It's seventy two dollars to get in. <laughs> yeah, but but that's that's it's amazing, though. You know, it's it's it takes a lot of money to operate a zoo. People have our it cost us 13 million dollars to operate the zoo in Land Park. So I do have a question and it may seem like a small one compared to the grand picture, but whenever we go to the zoo, which is several times a year, I notice that the bricks that are, have the bronze thingies on them, but they're starting to be removed probably by the people that put them there. Are all those things that have commemorative things, the benches, are those going to go with? No, those supported the zoo where it's at now. So they're people not. can claim them back maybe if there's no zoo there. I, we haven't even got there yet. I, I assume if someone really it's wants so something. Sad. Well, if someone really wants that, then they can get it. But, you know, it's for the life of the project, gotcha. right? And the zoo is moving. We're not selling bricks. When we tell people who want benches. Why don't benches, we selling? Yeah, right? I'm just claiming. We, we, you know, it's interesting. We have people who still want to buy benches and we tell them, you know, we have no guarantee this is going to go. They're like, oh, I still want a bench. We're like, okay. So I have two questions from people in the online audience. The first one is, will the new zoo include arachnid and insect exhibits? There are uh, major indoor habitats with terrariums in the second phase. California especially has two indoor exhibits that will have uh, one focused on uh, the deserts and one focused on the forest and waters. And that's the area where you would see insects and arachnids. Yeah. Uh, indoor exhibits have to be climate controlled. They're very expensive. If you notice goes back to the question of climate. For the first phase, we really focused on grassland animals because we're going to add shade for them, but it's not as, the investment is not as much as building like a rainforest for gorillas or building an indoor climate controlled building. So eventually you'll see a full array of animals, almost everything except marine mammals and elephants for various reasons, but everything else should be there. And the second question is, how much does it cost to join the Sac Sioux Society? Oh, you know what? I don't even know that. I go for free every day, but it's over. I think we have various member, various member uh, levels and you can go to the website and join. And the benefit is you get free admission for a whole year. Judy, do you know? Nope. That's right. Yes, you're. I'll, I'll try to get to as many people as I can. This is, these are such great questions. Usually I don't get so many questions. This is wonderful. Well, I have two. One uh, is maybe a little too political to talk about. Yeah. How, how does the city of Sacramento feel about the change? Mayor Steinberg says this is a win for the region. He has Good. said that on several. He is so happy Good. and supportive of this. So we're happy too. Good. Are they going to throw some dollars at it? Or? Uh, that, that, I don't know I, about that. I can't answer that. <laughs> So the other question maybe is a more simple question, but I was just thinking about the transition and timing. So there must be at some point where you have to close the old zoo and open the new one and there's a downtime of something, I would assume. So I'm how's gonna, that work? Well, uh, I'm going to try to make it as quick and painless as possible. And it's really going to be... Are we talking weeks, months? No, I think it's going to be at least three months, at least, because it's about getting the animals adjusted yeah. and moving them over there. But that's about four and a half to five years away. I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but yes. I Is can't. Name Debbie? <laughs> Why not Sacramento? Why did the arena deal not work you out? You need to ask your elected officials about that. Was it the money? No, you, you need to ask them. We were willing to take any of those sites. Okay. That's what I can tell you. Any of the sites they presented to us would have worked but you would need to ask them. And it's a different council than it's now. So that's my politically correct answer. <laughs> if Elk Grove doesn't pass on May 8, is there a chance that the Sacramento sites will be revisited? I have no idea. I have no idea, really. I have put seven years of my life into this and uh, we'll see what happens after May 8. I was recently at the zoo and yes. noticed there were animated dinosaurs there. Yes. Are they going to move to the new one? No, they were there as a temporary exhibit. Okay. They're already gone. They left uh, April 8th. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, they were, they're life size though. And it was a great teaching opportunity for children. Uh, but yeah, they were a temporary exhibit brought in to help us. The owner really loves the zoo. So he wanted to help us out. He, he gave us a really nice deal so that we can boost our attendance. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It, it was excellent. Thank you. Um, I find myself deeply troubled by the sprawl and growth inducing impacts of the location. And I understand your answer from a moment ago that the city of Sacramento, for whatever reasons, didn't deal with that. But given that you are primarily a conservation organization, why is having hundreds of thousands of acres developed down south Elk Grove a good idea? Well, we're not developing hundreds of thousands of acres. We're developing 65 acres plus 10 acres for parking. So, you know, I can tell you all you want to know about bears and lions and tigers, but if you see one in real life, you're going to get more motivated to do something. And the area is zoned for something. So, you know, would you rather have a zoo there or would you want a housing development or a mall? Um, there is, you know, the solutions to the, the future of conservation is learning to live with wildlife, right? By taking former cattle pasture and turning it into a zoo, we're going to be attracting native wildlife, we're going to be building a better home. And by the virtue of having a zoo, it allows us to help save animals in the wild right here in California with the Western pond turtles and across the globe with Maasai giraffes. So I understand, you know, that, you know, urban sprawl is an issue, but animals around the world and here in California are facing challenges too. And I dare say the majority of you in this room have probably never seen a brown bear in the wild, right? Maybe a black bear. Maybe, maybe some of you have seen mountain lions. Maybe some of you have seen a banana slug. I love the banana slug, but it's zoos are incredible teaching potential and for STEM education. And I get it. Right. I mean, I'm, my degree is in environmental science and ecology. Right. But we need a new zoo and uh, we can do amazing things for the community with it. So thank you. Question for you on, you mentioned 150, 200 million mm -hmm. societies got to come up with 50. That 200 million, is that just, I assume, for phase one? That's just for phase one. And what are we talking about? There's four phases. What's their projections on those costs and timeline? We have, we have not done timelines or projections on the future phases. And it sounds like a lot of money, but the truth is there are many zoos in this country that have that type of investment. If you look at what's been going on, we just haven't here in Sacramento. Zoos are not inexpensive to maintain. So um, there's there's a uh, there's a major investment just bringing utilities to the site, right? Those utilities have to go in for whatever goes there. That's not even included in that 200 million. So we are just focused on getting the first phase open. We believe that once we get that first phase open, we'll be in a better position to fundraise for the future phases. Yes, but the first phase is enough that people, it's going to be much better than the zoo we have now. Uh, and the first phase might not, I do not believe the zoo will be, oh, the entire zoo in terms of all those phases, I could be retired by the time they're done, right? I mean, you just don't know. It can take a long time and they might be built in sub phases, but my job is to get that first phase open. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you could be there. You could be there. Most people are going to, they say are living to a hundred now. So, you know. So are you chasing federal money as well? The, there, there is, we are chasing every money we can. But the project has to be approved first before any state or federal dollars can be attached to it for grants, like an MLS grant or something like that. But, you know, it just, uh, it has to be approved May 8th. So, Janet, do you have any question? Any more questions from Zoom? You do. Why don't we do yours, and then that gentleman will close us out. Uh, who currently owns the property where the proposed zoo will be located? The city of Elk Grove. Okay, and then what kind of fundraising activities do you do? Oh. We held a happy hour at the zoo last Thursday night, age 21 and over, where we had a cover band and 
all the proceeds went to the zoo. We have a gala. I think our gala, I forget the date. I think it's early October. Is it September, late September this year? We are happy to meet with individuals to talk about gifts. Gifts can be spread out over five years. Um, you know, we recognize gifts of $10,000 and above at the new zoo, um, but every bit helps. So there's many different ways we fundraise. We write grants. We have uh, different programs. You name it. There's a group of Girl Scouts that came in with a check for $500 and did a bake sale, you know? Mm. How many employees uh, when for, when the first phase is fully running? So we have about 150 employees right now. The first phase, we should have about 250 employees, give or take. Jason, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're a great audience.